Ingram Smith, Bud Elliott, back again for another episode of the Nolcast. Bud, excited to uh, catch up. We tend to, uh, you know, do these not as frequently during the summer. This summer, a little bit even more so. As sad to admit, we've both gotten older, and life has requirements of us that sometimes make podcasting a little more challenging. So, uh, and also, the, I think the older you get, the more you realize, like, hey, when you get five days to not do that of what you do the other 355 you probably need to try to enjoy those and absorb it as much as possible so and we got season preview season coming up man yeah i love the uh the summer session season uh, or summer session series that you've done uh it's been great i haven't gotten the chance to listen to the one that i've that you've done with brendan but i will do that in the next couple of days and uh it's a long one it's, uh, it's like 46 yeah, it, minutes it, it, or something like that. It's like 46 that. minutes. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was good uh, and, and and long. Oh, man. Speaking of life, Buddy just invited me to play like one of the nicest courses in Florida on Friday. And I am previously committed to going to see Dirk Bentley in Tampa. <laughs> now, it's a party bus. It'll be a good time. You know, no, time. no, no kids. And, you know, got invited to do that. But. Mm. Think things you do for marriage, right? Yes, absolutely. As I'm okay. learning, as I'm yeah. learning, so. uh, <laughs> that was Maine. Uh, Maine was awesome. Maine was brilliant and uh, perfect place to go away for a couple of days in the middle of a deep South summer. So uh, it was fantastic. Oh, it's been uh, hot, man. Yeah, it's gotten gotten a lot hotter recently here, and um, you know, probably not going to be any different for the next six or eight weeks, but. Uh, We've got a ton of listener questions that I look forward to getting to. A lot of uh, questions from our Patreon. And uh, speaking of which, when I was coming back from the Atlanta airport, Bud, I was sitting there waiting at the baggage carousel and talking for uh, four or five minutes to my wife about something. And then uh, a guy just who was standing next to us uh, asked me if I was uh, if I was <laughs> me. And I said, yes, I am indeed. And uh, he was a Patreon subscriber to the Nolcast, so shout out to Lucas. It was great to be able to just meet somebody uh, by chance like that. And uh, I can tell you that my my wife successfully shamed him into becoming a member of the Battle's End uh, as well. So, you know, just a wonderful uh, interaction for everybody out there. So shout out to you, Lucas, and shout out to the uh, 12 or 13 Patreon supporters uh, who have given us the questions that will make up a lot of today's uh, episode. So. Thank you, as always, to those who uh, go the extra mile to make the null cast possible. And I'm just sitting in a chair here that just keeps dropping. And I fixed this three times before we started recording. That's really, really frustrating. Uh, nonetheless, we'll get into the show um, real quickly. Just wanted to mention uh, a report out there, something to keep your eyes open, uh, tied to the solo show that I did a couple of weeks ago that Georgia Tech uh, may have a naming, may have a stadium naming rights uh, deal in the works potentially with Hyundai. That would be very interesting, uh, would give you a decent idea as to the market. But I think I even said this during the show that like stadiums like Baylor, Louisville and Georgia Tech, they're a little bit different because they're on some of the busier, you know, they're on the major highways of, of the country. Georgia Tech happens to be on a stretch where 75 and 85 come together in the middle of downtown Atlanta. I don't necessarily know that that is uh going to be reflective of what florida state might be able to get out there but you know then again florida state's a much bigger football name and brand than uh than georgia tech as well uh so that will be interesting to see what happens and might be a another additional further data point in the conversation that we as a podcast had uh three or four weeks ago absolutely man that's that's definitely worth watching obviously you know especially since georgia tech uh, pretty well known. They struck out on their top coaching candidates and had to go internal because they were broke. So, you know, uh, as they try to rebuild that program and find some money, it seems to be, seems to be important. Important. Um, and two very historical names on, on that field, just, uh, from growing up in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's interesting to see a, a university that had fought to, <laughs> Uh, fought to tie itself to his history as much as it has in Georgia Tech. There's not many out there, but Georgia Tech kind of has its own version of uh, like the five rings, yo crowd uh, who will be like, Hey, we won three national championships in the 1950s, which is, you know, that's, that's awesome. 
uh, but a proud, proud institution that doesn't have the uh, the bank account right now that maybe it once had. So, absolutely. Uh, since we've been gone uh, last like ten days or so, a couple uh, commits that are worth knowing. Uh, we're not going to go over every commit. We'll go over the guys that you know are kind of definitely FSU quality, I guess. Uh, let me see. So first, about six weeks ago, maybe maybe five weeks ago. Uh, after the Dylan Stevenson news, I had said that like it's very important that FSU uh, find somewhere, and they're, they're going to have to go out of state to do it to get a a uh, you know a DN with real like game changer upside because they failed to do so in last year's class at the high school level. And DD Holmes was the guy that we named, and they got DD Holmes in the boat, four star defensive end with some serious measurables, you know, six six two fifty out of Gonzaga High School there in dc I, I think he's a, a player with some real upside and, and a guy who's worth going after so uh, nice job by the staff there uh, to go and get that one i'm sure he likes all the opportunities that are available to him in tallahassee and you, know, you beat out some some programs that are also you know on the rise not like a georgia bama level but like south carolina wanted this kid a lot so they are also a program on the rise if issue is ahead of of the gamecocks in their development but Nonetheless, an important get, especially after the uh, the failures with last year's class and, uh, at that position. Uh, Ricky Knight is a player that uh, we, we have as a three-star 24-7 sports, uh, four-star on the composite. And that's probably about fair, right? Somewhere between like 300 to 500 grade is, is most likely uh, appropriate there, I would think. Versatile athlete, defensive back, can maybe play some nickel. I, I can see the take, understand the take, and, and think he could be a valuable piece of the class, especially if you're going to use him sort of in that nickel role. Third kid, I'm actually pretty excited about uh, this Elijah Moore kid out of good counsel up in Maryland. Uh, again, you know, kind of going to the DC area. I got to see him at OT7 uh, quite a bit out there in California uh, when I was out there for the Elite 11. Uh, OT7 finals were going on at the same time, which is interesting planning, maybe not good or bad, just depending on, on how you think about it. Uh, not a guy with big time speed, but he does have a legitimately uh, big frame. And when I watched him, he, he played big. So uh, w was able to use the size to beat out defenders. And he caught the ball with his hands consistently. So uh, there's some things I liked about that. Those are kind of the three kids, in my opinion, uh, who they've landed recently, who are you know big time kids or potential like you know, guys that you think, if you're trying to win a national title, can do they have the upside to develop into something? I think Holmes definitely does. I think more in a, in a defined role does. And you know, Ricky Knight, we'll, we'll see. Like, like could be a valuable piece of, of of the defense as they continue, you know, to build this class. Uh, you know, you got one five star right now in Landon Thomas. Kerman Hope got a got a pretty big bump uh, in the recruiting rankings by pretty much all the services. I, I think he's now sitting at. 107th in the composite, uh, you know, and you have what three, six or seven guys in the top 300 right now in the composite. That's that's better than, than, than you have been doing. So things are are generally trending in the right direction. Um, still want to see you know better recruiting done by the defensive staff, uh, but hey, it, it is what it is. We we, we know that different head coaches value different things in terms of, of staff abilities. You know, some are more into coaching, some are more into recruiting, and some get the guys who can do both. And so that's kind of my take on recruiting right now. We'll continue to see if they can land, you know, some more of these top 100, you know, five-star type players, the the big-time difference makers. But overall, uh, you know, things are going okay. Nice little recruiting update there, bud. Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> and always fortunate to be able to, fall back on your opinion and expertise uh, in the subject matter. Um, let's see, anything else we want to touch on as to developments with, uh, with the football team in general before we jump into listener questions? Uh, I can't think of, yeah, can't think of anything else that's transpired out there recently. The, the, only, the only thing I wanted to ask, ask you about, um, and if you can't comment, I, I certainly understand, there, there's been a lot of chatter there about sort of uh, the SEC unifying its its state laws mm. uh, with respect to NIL, obviously because Florida State is not in the SEC, but they are in a state 
that has an SEC program, the state of Florida would be included in that. Have you heard anything about that initially? Like, do you think there's any any real chance that that could happen? Uh, not not that not that Knowles and Gators work together all that often, but this would certainly be something that potentially could or or could not be you know, in, in the best interest of the great work you guys are doing over at the Battle's End and also for Florida State. Yeah, that's a good question, bud. I would say that um, state laws are always being looked at and reviewed. Uh, I don't think, I think the idea that you would have like 14 state laws or however many states ultimately make up the SEC once they get done expanding uh, that are exactly uniform, I don't think that's going to happen. I d there's a, like, there's an announcement coming out next week uh, having to do with the NIL world that I'm very excited about that has more than to do with the battles in. And, I, and it has more to do with Florida State. Let me put, put it that way. Um, so I'm in communication with a decent amount of people that run collectives across the across the country, particularly across the southeast, because that's where you know the major footprint of college football is. Uh, I don't think you'll see uniformity. I do think that you'll continue to see an evolution of this process and continue to see states basically question the NCA's authority on a lot of this. So you, you saw a and M their, yes. their, their statement, right? They're like, that, Oh there's yeah. no, mm -hmm. you can't get any more questioning the NCA's authority than, than what a and M has done. Uh, I don't know that, you know, each state and each institution are going to follow their own path and make their own decisions. Um, I'd be surprised if, if everybody is as bold as what Texas A&M has done. But um, I think most people would agree that we're heading in a general direction with some similar endpoint. It's just a matter of how long it takes for us to get there. Well, and I, I think there's, there's a general strategy point. Do you need to be as extreme as Texas A&M is doing with this? Mm-hmm. Like, let, yeah. you can let them take the heat, right? Like, at some point, this is going to go to court. So, it yeah. absolutely is. Yeah, I, I would, I would assume. So, uh, yeah, let's do some of these Patreon questions, man. I'm excited. Derek Blevins or Blevins, a long time, like maybe like you know, first week <laughs> Patreon supporter. So, Derek, really appreciate it, my man. He asks, "Is there a chance that losing Pokey Wilson is a bigger loss than initially anticipated?" While he wasn't an exceptionally athletic receiver, Pokey came up uh, big with several catches throughout the year, and Travis seemed to look his way uh, when he needed a play to be make. Uh, should I expect a seamless transition with Coleman? Yeah, good question, man. Um, is there a chance that losing Pokey is a bigger loss? Yeah, I, I, and, and I think, you know, I personally think Pokey was a pretty significant piece of your offense last year. Uh, you're right, there was a element of... Uh, of like safety blanket. What's that expression? I always butcher that. Um, so, say, is there a, a safety valve? Uh, yeah, maybe safety valve. Like I don't a know. safety blanket. Ooh, safety blanket. Let's, safety let's go blanket. with that term for now. The weighted blanket, blanket that was Pokey Wilson. Yeah. Uh, you ever uh, used a weighted that, blanket? That trout. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Uh, okay. I do like those things. Um, so look, I here's the thing. I think potentially the guy that would be replacing Pokey Wilson isn't. Um, is a Coleman maybe a freshman, which, yeah, I mean, there is reason to be concerned uh, if that's the case. I mean, Vandravius uh, looked exceptional during spring practice, but spring practice is not college football. Uh, so, you know, you got to see how that transitions. Um, I will tell you that we had a battles in um, fundraising event about two weeks ago or so that uh, Jordan Travis and Jared verse were able to come out to. It was freaking awesome. Um, and I had a chance to talk to Jordan privately for just a second and asked him a lot about Coleman, just how he was fitting in, how, um, you know, the culture. I'm always interested in how culture works when you're continuing to bring kids in uh, and was thrilled with the responses and really excited about what Keon's ultimately going to be. I just don't know that he's going to be Pokey Wilson's replacement. I would I would look at him being something kind of different. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what what they do formationally, right? Like, you know, how how many how many two tight end sets they're going to run, you know, how much three wide stuff they're going to run, uh, and and how they'll use their receivers differently than they did last year. I I don't think that we were. There's some chance we're still underestimate or that we are underestimating Pokey Wilson's loss. I don't mm. think us that us on this show 
were underestimating his loss prior to Keon Coleman, though, right? Like, I mean, I think we were like, it's kind of important. Like, is yeah. Kentron really a one for one there? Like, do you really trust Winston Wright to be, you know, fully recovered? I, I think we were we were kind of banging that drum. But I think it's an interesting point. Like, does Keon Coleman completely alleviate that? Or does it simply bolster the room in different ways? Right. I, I think I think Coleman can do most things Pokey can do, and obviously do quite a few things better than than, than Pokey did. I mean, there's a reason the guy's uh, has the potential to be like a top hundred pick, mm-hmm. uh, and and was you know it was pretty freaky. But I mean, dude, uh, Keon Coleman, excuse me, try this again. On Terry Wilson was 11 yards per target last year Mm -hmm. and had a a drop rate that was like almost half of Johnny Wilson's. He he was pretty dependable and dependable in big ways. So certainly a guy that the defense has had to account for. Yeah. I think safety valve was the term I was looking for. Okay. Yeah. Safety valve. Safety valve. We'll go ahead and go. I'll try to write that down. Um, Safety valve. Next question comes from Connor. Connor asks, which happens first? Jimbo gets fired at AM or Florida State leaves the ACC? So we're going to say Florida State's leaving the ACC is just a declaration, not like when they yeah. actually leave. Okay. Cause that's, I don't think that's a question uh, if that's the case. But I still think Jimbo. Yeah. I'm going to say Florida State. Okay. I guess this depends on well, I, clearly I, I was about to say this depends on when you think the things happen, but yeah, like that's the entire crux of the question. Uh, that, thanks bud. Good podcast. <laughs> um, it kind of depends on how, like how good you think things are going to go for and in this fall, unless you really think FSU is going to declare, mm-hmm. you know, in the next like month, which is possible. Yeah. I don't know. It's, guaranteed what was the date that we listed and not not that you august necessarily 15th? Like, august 15th was what we waited so. for last year before we started talking about this because we knew we knew nothing was going to happen last year and whenever you talk about conference expansion people tend to think that it's going to happen in like four days or something like that um yeah just write it down on your calendar take a look and again i don't you know if you're leaving a conference and you're challenging uh grant a rights deal that's anywhere from you know potentially 400 to 650 million dollars i don't know that you <laughs> you know, adhere to the date of leaving either, uh, maybe at that point. But I, I do think that's still a, a significant benchmark to to look at and keep in the back of your mind. PIF, baby. <laughs> you familiar? The, uh, the um, yeah, we, we had mentioned like private financing, blah, 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 blah. And everybody's like, hey, do you think like the Saudis? Well, like, I, I do not think it's going to be like, mm-hmm. Four state Seminoles presented by the Saudi by you know, the PIF private investment fund of uh, of Sheikh Mansour or something like that. But it, but the A and M thing reminded me because like they already have a campus over there in uh, in Qatar, right? The, the oh, a- do they? Texas that, I mean, that would make sense with yeah, as much with, uh, with the oil engineering. Yeah, with the the engineering and some of the some of the uh, rather advanced work that goes into searching for said subject matter. Uh, All right, let's make the question tougher. Okay. Let me pull up AM schedule here. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. AM goes seven and five or worse. Does the answer change? I'm going to stay with my answer. Okay. I I just you know a lot, lot going on out there, uh, and we'll you know we'll keep an eye on it. Yeah, I, I think that's that's fair. <clears throat> um, all right, so let's go here to. Uh, oh, Amy? Uh, is this is this Amy or, or Ami? I think it's Amy. I think I've asked oh. this before. I, I'm gonna say Amy. Amy, if I've if I've butchered your name. Uh, Congratulations. You can add yourself to a long list of Florida State players and coaches that I've uh, unfortunately done the same to, but uh, certainly appreciate your Patreon support. And she writes, hello, Bud and Ingram, been a listener for long, uh, for so long, and eventually I hope I will meet you guys. I hear all the hype. And as a longtime Seminole, I have to say the main emotion I have for the coming year is skepticism. So um, I want 
I so want last year to not be a fluke and something we can build on. And I guess I'm snake bit over the last few seasons. As excited as I am to have the talented uh, tight end transfer like Jaheim Bell, I'm curious how he will be best used in Norvell's offense, uh, which to my somewhat novice eyes seems to not be heavy using a tight end. And by the way, yeah, he's so big in talent. Or he's a big talent. Uh, so what should I expect to see? I have been screaming from the stands uh, for a long time uh, to hope to see the tight end incorporated in this offense. And I'm excited to see what his full potential could be. Um, so uh, all right. a couple of things. First of here. all, <laughs> we would like to meet you, too. If you want to meet us, you can go August 12th to the Tampa Seminole Club VIP kickoff party. You can get tickets at the link in the show notes, both on YouTube and on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, et cetera. Hit us up. Get that VIP ticket. We are the VIP speaker. So pretty cool. You can feel like you're standing right inside Doe Campbell Stadium, second floor of the Italian club. You can skip the long check-in lines. This is going to be pretty dope. Um, you can also hear us talk, which is pretty cool, at 1230. A little four-hour event, I think it is. Um complimentary top shelf which will be solid we will not have too much top shelf because then the talk might go completely off the rails if you want to have too much top shelf get a driver uh complimentary catered food as well swag from tampa Knowles and other vendors get an, a raffle for two fsu lsu game tickets mm. first tier on the 30 or 40 yard line that's uh again that's base value is going to encourage you to go look at what those tickets are going for uh, that might do you think that that ticket price per ticket will go with a comma by game day yes i do i think so i too. do um i think right now are, the, aren't the worst 600 worst seats in the stadium like 240 bucks or something like that to 280 i've been getting an increasing number of ticket or people asking for ticket hookups i'm like this is a small stadium guys yeah like, this is not a good game to be like hey i can get some yeah. ticket hookups too i think There's i mentioned a this of- a couple episodes ago i knew i knew the ticket demand for this one was different when like players parents were like hey do you have do you know where i get extra tickets i'm like no no, no i don't that's i don't know that's not a request i've ever heard before uh um, this could so. be a good time so everybody needs to check this out promo code nolcast gets you your discount I think I think it's gonna be a, be a really good time. So, yeah, we're both both gonna be down there, and we really, really appreciate the Tampa Knolls reaching out for uh, to us and asking us to do this. Second part of this response, I don't know about you, man. I don't. Last year to me was not a fluke. Okay, they, I think that team legitimately played roughly what the analytics say that they were, which was a you know solid top twenty type football team. You know, yep. like they're definitively better this year roster wise i don't think it's really close yeah roster wise d- definitely i mean you you just use the term yeah they are uh they right they brought back everybody but you know really one player and they added six to eight really significant pieces so you're better um not saying that like you would think they're a fluke but i do think that there's some reason to have a little bit of skepticism in your mind just because of what happened and and you and I, you know, we, we know our opinion on bowl games, but still the last two games of the year, you played teams that were kind of average, particularly Oklahoma that didn't have their starting offensive line. And, you know, you didn't do that at the line of scrimmage that, you know, maybe you would have expected to. So I, I think there is a little bit of legitimacy there. Uh, and I don't want to say this, like, I'm not trying to sound sexist at all when I say this. I legitimately have loved getting to know more of the Nolcast audience because it's given me an appreciation for how many women follow college football and, and love it at a level that maybe people don't automatically associate. And then Amy's question just reminded me that it's a great question, Amy. I'm thrilled with what they're going to do with Jaheim Bell. And it's, you're going to see it some this year. You're going to see it even more next year, very different prospect, but like Kyle Morlock is a, is a big damn time player as well. Uh, there's a there's a lot to be really excited about um, and what this offense uses the tight end, how it uses the tight end, and outside of even the tight end conversation, how it uses Jaheim Bell. You can literally line up Jaheim Bell at three different positions. Uh, you, you know, you want to talk about being multiple, put a guy out there that you can line up as an H-back on first down, a tight end as a second down, and a power running back on third down. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's wild. So 
Uh, I am very, very excited to see what it looks like. And, you know, Cam McDonald was a nice player, but um, making significant improvements, significant, significant improvement. No, no doubt about it, man. I mean, like, I'm, if Florida State was out of running backs due to injury, they would not ask Cam McDonald to move back there. South yeah. Carolina did, right? Yeah. I mean, Good like, like he, you know, he is a a different level of athlete than what you've had at the position. And you know, we talked about is Keon Coleman uh, a one for one stylistic replacement to what on to what uh, uh, Pokey was? And I think in some ways, yes; in some ways, no. I actually do think that Jaheim Bell may be able to do a decent number of, of the things that Micah Pittman. Uh, did for you, right? So, I mean, Gene Bell's not a huge guy, 6'3", 233. Pittman last year, outside receiver, 21.9% of the time. Slot receiver, 75% of the time. Inline receiver, uh, which basically is like lined up as like a tight end or H-back, 3% of the time. Mm -hmm. Bell won't be in the slot 75% of the time. But I bet you a lot of times when FSU goes three wide, that they are probably using... Jaheim Bell as as that slot guy um, to, to be able to create matchup problems for the defense. And I, I do think this is an area where Mike Norvell and his staff uh, do a good job, for sure. And I, I think that overall, like managing the program, check. Offensive coaching, clearly they're, they're a well-coached offensive football team. And within that, they do use formations and some motion uh, to try to get people to declare what they're going to do defensively and to try to force bad matchups for the defense. And you know, teams are going to have to figure out, like, can you light box Florida State, right? Can you play smaller personnel against the Seminoles when they have Morlock and Jaheim Bell on the field, right? Because technically that's, that's 12 personnel, a back and two tight ends. But also Bell runs kind of more like a receiver in some ways and is not your typical like tight end size tight end. How are you, how are you going to match up to that? Are, are you going to try to play that with three backers? Are, are you a base nickel team? Do you want to stay in nickel? If so, how well will, will Jaheim Bell block? Do you have him matched up on a guy who, if he gets his hands on him, it's basically good night. Well, that could be really advantageous for you in the run game because Johnny Wilson is all is already a fairly effective blocker. And I think it's kind of an underrated part of his game. If he becomes an even more consistent blocker, like Micah Pittman was a pretty damn consistent blocker. He didn't always pancake guys, but he didn't miss much. Wilson has some pretty impressive like pancake style blocks from the receiver position. But dude, I think if Johnny Wilson becomes a little bit more consistent in his blocking, the level, the quality of blocks when he actually gets the guy blocked are, are really kind of game changing. And if Bell can, can be a consistent and willing blocker for you, out in space, in line as an H-back. I think that's one of the reasons why once he hit the portal, Mike Norvell and company had to be so excited to see him hit the portal because of how much they really do with formations. Like, they get in a lot of different looks. And I, th I think they act with some intentionality there in doing so. Um, so I'm, I, I think you're going to see him catch the ball quite a bit on short and intermediate routes. There'll probably be some play action deep type stuff. But getting the ball in this guy's hands on screens, especially against teams that are playing a little bit more light, light box, he's a difficult dude to tackle, right? He does have some running back wiggle to him and, and some difficult uh, ability to bring down in the open field. I, I'm I'm excited about it. Uh, I don't think last year was a fluke. I, I, it, there are certain things I think we can say might have been a little bit fool's gold. Like, was it really a top 10 or whatever defense? In my opinion, no. But overall quality of the team the jump they made from 21 to 22 was not a fluke. The 22 team would, would beat the crap out of the 21 team. Mm -hmm. I think. Who do we got here? Uh, Mikey Lowe asks, what are the most important matchups in the opener against LSU? All right. Um, almost every single one is important, but like a couple fun ones. Is it the most important? I don't know. Is it is it the one that I'm looking forward to the most? Uh, who's the kid that that verse got the best of last year? The freshman Will, more Will Campbell, who, who ended up yeah. being really good last year. Yeah. Ultimately, that's that was his first ever game. He turned into a hell of a player by the end of the year. Yeah, yeah. and and I'm excited to see. Now, to be fair, he was Verse's second playing, team All SEC as a true freshman left. Yeah, out. yeah. Verse was playing his first game. You know, not playing for Albany or whatever. So, two different kids. 
entering into a different level. But first, it's a, it's a damn grown man. Uh, and that kid will be held a lot closer to it this year. So uh, that is one that I'm really excited to see. And uh, I can't even, I don't know, man. I, <laughs> I can't even talk about that game to an extent. It's uh, I'm so excited. It's so important. Uh, it legitimately feels like you've got a potential playoff game as your opener. And that's, that's, Wild uh, to have, wild to be able to talk about, and wild for this fan base to have gotten there so quickly. So uh, that's that's awesome. Um, I'll go the Battle of the Smiths. Mm. Marie Smith against Mason Smith. Mm. Mason Smith was the uh, he was like the number one overall player in the country on Rivals, a consensus top ten player in the country across the board. All, all the recruiting services, big time, big time defensive tackle was a what, sophomore last year, I think. Ended up blowing his ACL in the second quarter of yep. that, that game in the Superdome. Uh, was making a pretty big impact in that game, uh, mm-hmm. honestly, before he blew his ACL. And I I think Florida State probably still wins a game last year. Because like all kinds of crazy stuff happened, happened at the end of that ballgame, too. Uh, from you know, people fumbling punts on their, on their end to you know, goal line um, – fumbles on on pitches that the goal line on FSU's in we will, we don't need to revisit that but if Mason Smith is back and healthy uh, that's that's a guy that, that Florida State probably needs to double team consistently because like I don't think Marie Smith can handle him one on one just you know what what did Jimbo used to say they, they don't let lightweights fight, fight heavyweights and Smith's gotten a lot bigger than than he, than he used to be and, and has put in some some good work in the weight room. Mason Smith is like, if he's healthy and, and plays to his ceiling, is like the best interior defensive tackle in the country. So yeah, I mean, you said he's yeah. A, he's I'm a not trying to knock most kid Smith in the country here. coming out uh, yeah. coming out of high school, uh, and you know, that's, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, um, I will say another matchup that I'm excited to watch here is Mike Norrell and Alex Atkins against all of the new pieces in the LSU secondary and how Mike and Alex will use formations like we just talked about in the last one, last question, to create coverage bus against a lot of new pieces that Matt House, who I think is a really good defensive coordinator for LSU, how he'll, he'll be able to implement all those guys in. Do they know all their coverage checks? They haven't played together a whole lot. They're good players. I mean, like Denver Harris was really damn good when he was on the field last year for a He just got kicked out because he was you know, doing a million miles an hour in a parking garage and, and doing it on Instagram Live, which is not, not a great move um, generally. But like Deuce Chestnut from Syracuse can play, right? The, the, the Johnson kid from Ohio State, they think can play. The, they're very excited about the kid they took from Southeast Louisiana, Cy Alexander. There's still a whole lot of new pieces in your secondary. How do those guys communicate? Can Mike Norvell and Alex Atkins create a coverage bust or two that allows you to hit uh, not freebie because you got to earn them, but you have to work for them. You, you, you have to show the different formations over and over again and, and vary off them. Can they create the wide open explosive play opportunities that like, I think you're going to have to have Johnny Wilson and Keon win one-on-one matchups. Can you create a couple one-on-nones where you mm-hmm. get some busts? And, ex- and I think if you're Norvell and, and staff, Aren't you pretty happy this is the first game of the year? Like, they would line up and play this thing tomorrow, I think, given the amount of returning experience. And you see what I'm saying? No, yeah, yeah, no. I mean, you're, you're, it's a reason why Bill Connolly says you're the, you know, most experienced team in college football or whatever it is this year. You, you would, you'd want to play it immediately. And I think you're right, as, as you were last year, uh, <clears throat> better to play LSU earlier than later. So, um, by the way, the other kid, the right tackle for them, ended up uh, Emory Jones Jr., who was also a true freshman, ended up being fairly okay down the stretch. So I, I think they're pretty good up front, man. Um, hmm. they, they did take this kid from Maryland, Mason Lunsford. I don't know how he'll be, uh, but like they get Dellinger, Marlon Martinez back. That should be a pretty, maybe the best offensive line you face this year. Probably, probably, yeah. Um, Want to always thank our friends, uh, legendary team and uh, legendary home loans. Uh, Bud and I have been fortunate to partner uh, with these guys for uh, a long damn time, five or six years. Bud's gotten two mortgages through them. Uh, I'm 
continuing to kick around an opportunity uh, as well. Just the best in the business, best partnership that we could ever hope to have uh, with with sponsors, uh, particularly in a field like this. Eight four four FSU loan again. Eight four four FSU loan. Uh, the legendary team, and uh, we thank them as always for the support that they've provided uh, the Nolcast and and uh, for the emails that they continue to send me uh, with uh, with closing deals, updates, and everything else. So uh, awesome, and always want to thank those guys. I got my new home report emailed to me from Legendary. Uh, not new home, but my, my updated home value report. I was like, mm. man, this feels good. That those, those guys worked hard for me and, and, and got me a great rate. And uh, um, as they do everybody, and you don't close as many loans as they have uh, for our listeners w- without working really hard and being a great, great team. Uh, Ian asks, okay. With potentially having the best Florida State team in 10 years or so, I was thinking of the gap that still exists between FSU and Georgia. To better understand it, I was thinking of an offseason exercise. How many NFL players and at what positions could FSU add to its roster until you guys would feel comfortable predicting an FSU national championship this year? <laughs> okay, this is kind Great of cool. Great question, man. This yeah, is fun. Yeah. I mean, I, I love our first of all, let's say eight years or so. Uh, I mean, you know, this is uh, – yeah. Let's not compare this team to 13 or, or even 14 when it comes to what the roster looked like. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's fun, man. I, I, I don't love – and it's it's probably – it's only fair because you're always going to compare yourself to the apex of the sport. But, like, there's there aren't many, if any, programs that look at their roster in Georgia and be like, yeah, we're, we're right on par with them, definitely. Um, so, and I, I'm not sure – Florida State's far enough removed from some of the worst years in program history to expect to have a legitimate uh, benchmarks with Georgia either. Um, sure. So, like, uh, but I do love the question. It's fun. Um, so I make Georgia right now a – that was Georgia State. Excuse me. Let, let me make sure I'm pulling up the right tab here. <laughs> uh, Georgia is definitely not a negative 10. Uh, so I, I make Georgia a 31. Right. If you want to use Bill Connolly's scale, I make Florida State a 21 and a half. So if they played right now, basically Georgia by 10 would, would, would be the spread. Now, look, does that feel light? Georgia was 17 last year over TCU and, and they, they won by 56. Mm-hmm. But that's also like a Georgia team that's made the playoffs. So when you go to the playoffs, you kind of take your power rating and you just bump it to the ceiling for everybody because you're right. assuming everybody that made the playoffs is, is playing at, at their highest possible level. If they lined up to play tomorrow, both teams have questions. Both teams have a lot of things going for them. I, I think the line would not be single digits. Like, like, it is safe to say FSU would, would be double digits against Georgia. Yeah. Probably nobody else. Maybe Ohio State would be 10, but probably not. So, uh, and obviously there's room for Georgia helium if the quarterback looks as good as, as maybe they think. Like they probably immediately go to like a 33 or 34 if uh, if Carson Beck looks great. Yeah. We, we need to define some things for this question, though. Like, do we – so how many NFL players and at what positions? Are we just saying like like random NFL starter or like – because if you put Patrick Mahomes on this team, they probably win the national title, right? I mean, you would have, yeah, yeah. I mean, let's, let's like, say so. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, let's the guy's won Super Bowls. He's probably winning national titles. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, so let's just say what, like, average NFL starter at the position? I'm, I'm going to edit his question slightly for me. Answer it for you as you, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to say the three places that I would add NFL starters on this roster okay. to, that I would think might make you competitive at, at, against Georgia. Uh, I need a 10-year NFL vet at center. I need a 10-year NFL vet at linebacker. And I I need a like an all-pro level safety. And I would feel maybe, you know. I would go uh, quarterback for sure. And that's not a shot at Jordan. I think Jordan is an excellent college quarterback. The difference between like a legitimate – mid-level NFL starter, you know, so like not Josh Allen, not Mahomes, but I don't know. I, I name, uh, 
like Tua is probably a, like a, a midline NFL starter, right? Mm-hmm. I would think. Like Dak Prescott's like he's he's too good. I would go quarterback because the, the ways that it opens up the passing game even more. It's just it's the most important position on the field, and I, I think it's it's the hardest one to play. And the, the upgrade is just so sizable if you get a guy that's already shown he can do it at that level. Um, not that Jordan can't, but I, mean, I don't think anybody thinks he's going to be an NFL starter in twenty four, uh, even if he gets drafted, which I think he probably would get drafted if he goes pro. I think, yeah, I I do like your center one, um, for sure. That's good. I don't want to steal that though. That's 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 a really good one. I, I would take another defensive end. I think mm-hmm. just because of the ability to just wreck. Like if you give me a, a was legitimate number four for me, number yeah. four for me. Yeah, and I like Pat Payton a lot, and I think Turner has some upside. But if you put Verse with another DN there. I think that's pretty ridiculous um, as, as for your ability to do that. And really, like we're going with, are you familiar with the concept of like strong link system versus weak link system? Uh, yes, I'm familiar with it because I had a conversation with somebody about it two or three weeks ago. Uh, but I'm not, not not fully fluid, but I know what you're talking about. So for the listeners, right? Strong link system is where like the best player or the best part of the system is the most important part to its success. Weak link systems would be stuff where it's not how much the, like the top three guys matter. It's can they pick on the fourth guy type thing. So receiver strong link system, right? Quarterback clearly strong system and it's basically its own system in itself because the, the the effects good or bad are, are, are so outsized offensive line generally a wink link a weak link system uh defensive backfield kind of the same weak link defensive line kind of different actually strong link because of the ability to, to demand double teams and the ability to just completely wreck shop see also like a nick fairly uh on that 2010 mm-hmm. auburn team with uh with cam yeah, I would go quarterback, D end. And pr- See, I feel like I like the D tackles enough, so I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. But I don't. Uh, do you? Do you go receiver and get like a third legitimate, like, you know, top half of the uh, uh, NFL type thing? Like, that would be pretty nuts. Mm-hmm. It'd be tough. It'd be tough. You got two six foot four and taller wide receivers and then some, you know, NFL wide receiver running around as the third. I think that's fair. Yeah. I mean, think about that LSU team from 2019 that had yeah, that's... Jamar Chase, Justin. <laughs> now, granted, they had two of the better receivers in the NFL on their team at one time, plus, plus a pretty good third. I, I could see safety. Yeah, I could see safety. I could see corner. Like if you if you took three, yeah. Th- then I I think I, I like your three though quite a bit. Well, I, I would go quarterback, but. Yeah, those those make a lot of sense. Yeah, fun question, Ian. Thank you, man. That's uh that's fun and a little bit different than a lot of what we get on a subject matter like that. So uh Santosh uh, writes, thanks for recommending legendary. Yeah, most definitely. That's awesome. And I guess I probably should have read these questions and put the ad reads in uh, at the appropriate time. So Maybe in year 14, I'll get this podcasting thing right. But uh, <laughs> the closing company said that my mortgage rate was the best they'd seen in recent months with all the right hates. Right hate. Rate, rate hikes. hikes. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and I'm still working on this English thing in year 39 as well. Uh, it is said the best CFB team cannot beat the worst NFL team. Does maturity factor into this equation? If so, selfishly speaking, does a mature FSU team have a better chance of winning it all than most would expect? Okay. Um, I see what's, what's being asked here. Uh, I'm glad we got away from NFL versus college team. Cause that's, uh, 
always a, a short conversation in my opinion. Yeah. Now I, I do think that this helps you significantly. And if you get into a situation later in the year with as much experience as you have, and more of that experience uh, is blended together where the experience is experienced together and not some of the transfer portal stats that are drawing upon there. Um, I, I don't want to be overly simplistic, but yeah, I mean, I, I think this Florida state team has a chance that if, something were to happen, say like last year where a kicker actually makes a field goal in the semifinal and beats Georgia. You know, if you get a break and you don't have to go up against a crazy roster, then yeah, I mean, you've got a chance. You've got a chance. And one of the reasons you have a chance is because of the amount of experience uh, that you have on this roster. And I think a good blend of experience overall and experience with this coaching staff, uh, a decent amount of them have an experience with one of the more significant turnarounds that you could expect from a program. So um, yeah, I think there are some intangibles here uh, that Santosh is referring to that, that would work in Florida state's favor, particularly as you go through the course of a college football season. I, I can agree with that. Um, I don't think that maturity is the, is the reason why, uh, well, Santosh asked, like, does maturity factor into this equation as to why a college team couldn't beat an NFL team? It, to some extent, of course, but I think it's also more like physical maturity, right? Which implies that guys are bigger, faster, stronger than other guys. I, I don't know that you have that advantage in college against the most talented teams out there, right? Like, I don't think Florida State is bigger, faster, stronger just because they're older than the very best teams in the sport. I think the way you put it is good, right? Would we pick this team to beat a Georgia? No, we would not. If they didn't have to play a Georgia, then who knows, right? Now, would Ohio State have hung 60 on this defense last year? Yes, but this is not last year's defense. It's this year's defense. And I, I think there's a chance for some real improvement this year. So, yeah, I mean, if, you th if they're able to pull off like a serious Cinderella thing and win it, then, yeah, maturity will factor into it for sure. I'm not like increasing my ratings on them because of maturity necessarily. I think they've upgraded the talent and their experience factor is, is pretty high already, uh, which is, you know, which is fantastic. Like some of these guys that um, will likely lose their jobs are pretty experienced players. And that, that tells me that you've brought in dudes who are, are, are even more talented than they are. So that, that's your job to always keep upgrading the offense or excuse me, the, the, uh, the roster. Next, before we get to the next question, want to always thank our friends at Madison Social. Uh, I dropped the ball here. I'll get on the phone with Matt this week and have full details as to the tailgate that we are partnering with them on for the uh, LSU game, uh, Madison Social Township, uh, <clears throat> all the properties of the For the Table restaurant group, including the uh, the lovely rooftop bar, Charlie Park, that we're so fond of. Uh, if they're doing it, it's a first class uh it's a first class thing and uh, the tailgate will be no different. Uh, so always have those guys in the back of your mind. Like I said, I'll have more details uh, for you guys on the next podcast. Exactly. Uh, but if you're going to the LSU game, very much look forward to seeing you there and uh, very excited to continue to partner with our friends at Madison social. Um, Michael Johnson asked, and Michael, I want to thank you for the, uh, performance that you put on in the 1996 Olympics, seeing you break the world record was one of the greatest moments of my sporting, uh, sporting fandom. Uh, what positions still need to be filled in tribe 24, but I will, uh, I will throw this one over to you. Sure. So quarterback feel pretty good. Uh, running back feel pretty good. They would still like to take a big time receiver, uh, for sure. A, uh, offensive line, with uh, with Zendamella and Atite uh, going to USC, still has some needs. Uh, they're in on some some guys there who do have some upside, but it's not a great offensive line year in in, in the state, and it does appear to be better uh, for next year. So, I would not expect a huge huge class there. Um, you probably still want to find an, another uh, strong defensive end with with legitimate upside. You know, um, probably got to go get a defensive tackle. Right, depending on what you think about what's in the class right now, and there are some uh, some very you know, uh, widely varying opinions on on what they have in the class right now at defensive tackle. 
Um, linebacker is what it is. Uh, everybody knows my thoughts on that. I thought the promotion of Randy Shannon was a poor move. I thought the hiring of him to be an analyst in case you had a shot to get her a little right uh, was a good move, but uh, didn't think he should be a full-time coach on a staff that's trying to chase a national title. Nothing he has done recruiting linebackers has made me change my opinion on that at all. Like Beck has just only strengthened it. So linebacker, um, maybe uh, maybe somebody on the staff knows somebody again, like, like, like last year, and, and able to save themselves from that. Corner, obviously, Charles Lester and Jamari Howard uh, maintain uh, or remain the top two there on my board, and I think FSU's board as well. Uh, they like Kevin Levy, uh, the, the the defensive back as well, who's got some serious speed. Obviously, his game's a little bit raw. He's fairly tight with Ricky Knight, so I think there's some chance – he could be in the class, and then they're gonna have to figure out like what they're doing with the safety board. So they they just took Radarius Radarius Morgan, uh, who is potentially a useful piece out of Phoenix City, a guy who can definitely definitely hit and and be a, a kind of a versatile dude for you. I think like wh where does CJ Hurd fit in uh, to the class? Obviously, he's a it, if you guys have followed us, he's a um, a safety, but a little more of a linebacker build. We'll we'll see, and th that's basically it right now. Um, they're in this weird spot, man. And, and I think they're, they know it and I think they're addressing it. So this is not a great class of recruits, not FSU wise, but just in general, 24, we think as an industry is down, there's not a lot of big time guys at, at the premium positions out there. I think 23 was a lot better. I think 22 was better. And I definitely think 25, uh, and definitely 26 based on the early returns on 26, are better. So not all NFL draft classes are created equal. Not all college football recruiting years nationally uh, are created equal. So an optimal strategy, I think, would be to take a smaller high school class. However, we talked about this a couple months ago. You don't want to get the reputation as not caring about recruiting high school at all. You want to have high school coaches feel like you want their players. And you've taken relatively small high school classes in prior years. So I do think FSU has a bit of like a PR maintenance thing it has to achieve by taking a couple more high school kids this year so that they are not so heavily portal. Uh, and again, they have had great results with the portal. But at the same time, you take the FSU job because your proximity to talent and the fact that you have a great tradition of recruiting at the high school level. That's why I think you have to take a maybe a bit bigger class than the talent level available to you in the state would dictate. Not that you take guys that can't play, but like maybe the value add to the roster of taking, you know, what, 22 guys, 21 guys is not the same in 24 as it would be in like a 25 or, or would have been in a 23. Is that, I guess, a fair way to put that? Like yeah, yeah. No, image maintenance matters. Yeah, it does. It does. Definitely. All right. Uh, um, let's see. Like two more, maybe? Yeah, let's do two more here. <clears throat> Nicholas Whaley writes, so uh, what should Florida State's answer for Harold Perkins be in the upcoming opener? We didn't get to see him much last year in our game, and I'm assuming Mike and Co. are working on a game plan to accommodate his presence at linebacker. But I'm going to lean on you here on this one. Okay, so um, Harold Perkins, for those who do not know, maybe you just watched FSU or, or ACC ball, is a former five-star recruit. Came on a little bit slow early on freshman year, but then really hit the scene and dominated uh, the SEC in the month of October and had a very strong November as well. A lot of edge rushing for him. Pretty instinctive player, a guy who just has incredible burst and bend and is, is a, a nightmare to get blocked. A weird fit because I think he's a better – pass rusher than he is a linebacker but FSU's moving him more to off-ball linebacker this year to pair him with Omar Spates the uh, the excellent transfer linebacker they got out of Oregon State so if he's indeed playing that spot I think you got to watch the A&M film surprisingly like I, not not usually we, we go to A&M for for uh, for keys on how to play offense given their their track record over the last few years but A&M basically ran right at him and it's like, hey, like, don't don't let this guy chase and hit the play from the backside and, and have his speed impact it. 
Try to make him read as much as possible. Try to make him wrong as much as possible. And if necessary, try to make him come at you head on as often as possible. So uh, I'm interested to see, like, how much do they use Perkins to spy on Jordan Travis, right? I think the spy game will be an important part of both of these teams' strategy in this ballgame because Jaden Daniels, I think I saw the stat, and I want to give credit, I, I believe it was Sports Info Solutions. Well, his passing wasn't great last year. I think he had like the highest scramble rating um, in terms of like scrambling for yards of any quarterback in the last 10 years of college football. So in hindsight, FSU did a pretty good job containing Dan, you know, Daniels, he, as frustrating as it was to see him run around on that field in the Superdome. Uh, but Perkins may be a spy in this game. Like Part of this answer is unknowable because we do not know how they plan to deploy him. My guess here is that in long down and distance, they will get him uh, lined up as a pass rusher and 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 bring him. And that's a problem because nobody in the in the SEC seemed to be able to block him when he came on blitzes. He had uh, what do you have? Thirteen and a half tackles for loss, a havoc rate of five percent, which is just completely nuts and usually not something you see at the Power Five level. That's like a G five guy who didn't hit the portal is going to get drafted, no doubt, and, and just dominates his his competition. Um, Seven and a half sacks on just 141 pass rush attempts, which again is pretty nuts. 15% pressure rate led the team, obviously. Uh, so, yeah, like the guy's a beast. It, that's that's why you recruit five stars. Some of them bust. The ones who don't are generally game changers, and you will have to get him blocked. I think you're going to have to make him think a whole lot and and see see if you can get him get him thinking, get him a step slow because if if he if he knows where the play's going, he can just run after it. Yeah. It's it's very yeah. difficult. Yeah. Be great to have a well, – yeah, no, never mind. I'm not going to say that. All right, Jeff says, uh, final question here, Jeff. Uh, before we get to Jeff's question, I want to thank our friends at Congruity. Uh, just, I was talking to Bud earlier today. This has been another fantastic partnership. The Nolcast uh, – had a had an old friend of the Nolcast reach out yesterday about uh, potentially moving his business over to Congruity, and uh, hopefully that transpires. And I just want to check with him before I before I say that uh, out loud. And uh, look, Matt Lewis is exceptional. Uh, I've heard nothing but great things uh, back as to the experience with working with Matt, and I can personally testify from three or four times over uh, from working with Matt and his team at Congruity. Uh, that they are fantastic when it comes to payroll, HR, anything that you could possibly need to make your business uh, run in a more optimal fashion would highly encourage you to either go to congruityhr.com or friend, feel free to uh, send me a note uh, on social media and I'm happy to make a introduction to you there. month away, Jeff, so am I. Assuming a consistent starting offensive line is a key factor for a successful season, what is the over-under game total for the same starting offensive line for the Knolls in 2023? The over-under game total for the same... I mean, I... Hmm. So I don't there, want to say it's a weird, a bad question, but I'm just not sure what Jeff means. It's not a bad question. Obviously, okay. injury is going to be the biggest thing here. Is there anywhere where you could see maybe someone not necessarily losing a job, but a job transitioning over the course of a season? Um, maybe. I mean, maybe at center you could see that. Uh, maybe at, at a, one of the guard positions, depending on what happens at center. Um you know, I, I think I know who the tackles would be, but, you know, there's there's still a lot of pieces in play and, and pieces that you're not ultimately going to be able to evaluate until you see what actual game, you know, game tape looks like. So um, <clears throat> it's a storyline for sure. I mean, think about it. Like if the idea that Byers isn't a starter ends up true, which I think would be a problem. If it is, because I, I don't I don't think that represents your highest possible ceiling as an I think he's line. a starter personally. Look, yeah. my opinion means nothing. I think he's a starter at guard or tackle 99 percent. OK, I mean, that dude's going to start somewhere. If he's not, uh, you're in trouble. Yeah. Uh, or first, like your your, four, your two most important games are in the first month of the season. Yeah. You, you need to you need to play your high. All right. So you need to make sure your highest upside players are, are in the lineup and starting. 
I think Gideon Les Harris is going to be a starting tackle for you. I think he has to be. I think Rob Scott will be a starting offensive lineman for you, likely immediately, tackle. or do you think as he works his way back? Um, now that could be one. That, that could, could be, be one question. It could be one. Uh, absolutely. I don't think Armella is quite there yet, although there's been some progression. Um, the international kid they're so high on, but that's not a kid you're going to play first year. Uh, Lucas. And then it just works out, you know. Does the does the kid at Colorado see see play see a guard or a center? Um, it'd just be interesting to see. I think once you get your group, I don't think there'll be a whole lot of uh, changing. Although you're right, if if Rob Scott's maybe not ready in game one, but you would want him ready by game three. I mean, you're not you don't want to throw somebody back for Clemson. Is, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, yeah, it'd be fascinating. I mean, I mean, we could do a 30 minute pod on the offensive line uh, and and. Fortunately for you guys, we will in about four weeks. Uh, we will have our position exactly. preview series, and we might just have to kick uh, Jeff to that and to just have a better idea as to what the offensive line is going to look like and where some of these pieces will fall in. I'm excited, man. Yeah. Um, you got anything else for this week? I think that's uh, I think that's it for now. We I think we have maybe two questions that we'll just roll over towards next week as well. But we're you know getting into an hour here, and that's uh, yeah, pretty pretty definitive point of diminishing returns on content after about 45 minutes as far as who actually consumes it. So we don't want to go too far over that. Uh, appreciate all the support we receive. Uh, as always, if you get the opportunity to like uh, something we do on social media, subscribe to the YouTube page, like the YouTube uh, video itself. Uh, algorithms are silly, but algorithms are important. And uh, one of the reasons we've been so successful is the support that we've received uh, from our from our listenership, one, one of the main reasons we've been so successful. So uh, thank you guys, as always, for listening to us. This has been fun, bud. Great to catch up with you. And uh, it is not far at all. And very much excited as to what this uh, season looks like and very excited to jump into some of our more defined uh, seasonal preview podcasts that are not far, not far away at all. So with that, be another episode of the Nolcast.